Great. So welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, just early afternoon for those of you in Hong Kong. Early morning for some of us who are in the UK or in um, Europe. And uh, not least, good night to David, who is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and to other people in the US. So the last I checked, we had people from around the world. So Taiwan, India, um, Europe, uh, UK, Canada, Singapore, Poland. So welcome everyone. And first of all, I wanted to start by saluting you all, us all who took the time, who are taking the time to be here on a Saturday to learn, to connect and to be inspired. My name is Juliana. I am very honored to work with Kaduri Farm and Botanic Garden since uh, 2020, so nearly three years now. I work with the farm in the Kaduri Earth Program, of which this talk is part. And so for those of you who might be joining for the first time, the Kaduri Earth Program is an initiative that has the vision of creating spaces and experiences that help reconnect us with ourselves, each other, and the rest of nature, with the, the more than human world, as David would say. Um, so this is an ongoing learning initiative with programs online and also many programs on site at the farm with local and also international partners and collaborators. And part of the online programs is this series of online talks that we offer yearly. And this year, our theme is We Are Nature. So really bringing different speakers uh, and to their different experiences, uh, reminding us um, that we are not separate, that in fact, we are bounded to, again, in David's words, to this wider, wider body that is the earth. Um, so we are so grateful to have David today, but I, will, I just saw someone asked about the interpretation. So let me go to that information and then I'll continue. So you'll see that um, you, the simultaneous translation is available throughout the talk and you'll see in the control bar at the bottom that there is a, a language button and as a default, we are all in English, in the English channel. So if you wish to change to the change channel, please go to the language button and choose Chinese. There are choices uh, between Potonghua and Cantonese. Then if you only want to listen to the interpreter's voice, you can mute the original audio by clicking the same uh, language button. So I hope that works and if not, you can uh, send a chat to KFBG host and um, we'll be able to, to help. So um, coming back to welcome David, um, to say that we are really grateful to have him uh, with us today um, for his um, seminal work on bringing the sentience of this planet through his writings, through his talks and he has been a big inspiration, I know, for us and for people around the world. And you can read, of course, David's biography online. There's a lot of um, information on his work. Um, but as I was preparing for today to introduce him, I went back to my first encounter with um, David's work um, to remind myself of that first experience. And I first came across um, his work through his book, The Spell of the Sensuous, uh, a bit over 10 years ago when I was studying at Schumacher College, which is a sustainability center in the UK. And I was very struck when reading his book um, about something that wasn't just what he was writing about, but uh, how he was writing. So for those who know the book, or if not, I encourage you to read it. In the book, he will, David will weave his experience as a sleight of hand magician, living with indigenous communities in different parts of the world and in the field of philosophy and the philosophy of perception. 
And I was particularly struck uh, for the sense that it's as if he was writing about nature without writing about it. And, uh, and this was very um, uh, intriguing for me in how he was writing. And I was then also fortunate to meet David in person um, when uh, facilitating a couple of his courses uh, that he was teaching at Schumacher College. And, and then I was um, struck yet again, or uh, um, struck further, if one can say that. And that was to do with David's use of language in his speaking. So in the act of his speaking, um, not only what he was saying, but how he was relating to the words in his mouth and his mouth related with his whole body and his body with the more than his body. So that was part of uh, what made um, the encounter with his work so striking for me and uh, 10 years ago and I continue to be inspired. And so this is um, to give some, a taste of different layers of, of his work. And these are just some of them. And you, I'm glad we'll have this one hour and a half now to hear from David and I will pass on to him. But just before that, a few practical points for the, the smooth running of our virtual space um, today. So, um, to bring us closer in this session, um, I encourage you to bring your to put your cameras on, especially when we have the Q and A. Um, but it's a it's a way of reminding ourselves that we are bodies <laughs> sitting in a computer and not just a, a square in a screen. And um, after David's uh, sharing, I will invite you to share your questions in the chat. So throughout the, the talk, I encourage you to keep notes of your questions. Uh, so then when the Q&A is open, um, you are ready to type them in the chat and then I will um, read the questions to David. So um, a practical, very practical thing also to view the speaker, you can choose speaker option. And when we switch to Q&A, you can choose the gallery view. So also to, to have a sense of the many presences that are here. Um, be reminded that this session is being recorded and the aim is to share with a wider audience um, later of, um, with KFBG aud audience. As I said before, if you need any technical support, you can uh, send a direct chat message to where you see KFBG host and we'll help you. And um, the simultaneous um, translation, as I said before, in the language button um, at the bottom of your screen. And thank you all. And thank you for your patience with these practicalities. And now I will pass to you, David. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you so much. Um, can you all hear me OK? Um, uh, give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, is uh, an amazing and strange magic that somehow I can be speaking to you all in uh, some of you in Hong Kong, um, elsewhere in China, and it sounds like many different parts of the world. I am here. It is uh, almost midnight in northern New Mexico. Um, I live in the upper Rio Grande Valley, um, in the valley of, of the large Rio Grande River, in the foothills of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which are the southernmost spur of the Rocky Mountains, which are really the spine of the continent of North America. Um, and so I'm sort of at the bottom of the spine. Uh, I'm looking out my window uh, across the valley. It's all dark, of course, but there are some scattered lights uh, from the city. It's really uh, not a city. It's, it's not even a large town, but uh, the town of Santa Fe, 
many lights now in the valley um, as though the constellations in uh, the starry sky overhead, some of them had fallen down and, um, and started glimmering from the earth underfoot. And that's what it looks like through the window now. It's very hot here. It's unusually hot. And it has been hot for three weeks. I mean, of course it's hot. I live here in the high desert, but it's much hotter than hot. We are all melting. Um, and, um, and trying to find our ways to get cool or wandering down uh, to where the river is and jumping in uh, over and again. Uh, but the river's not very close to here. It's on the far side of the valley. It's many miles away. Anyway, here I am with you all um, in, in the various parts of this big world where you're situated. I'm David. Uh, I am uh, a cultural ecologist, uh, which sort of combines anthropology and ecology. Um, and I am a philosopher, or what some people call a geophilosopher. A geophilosopher, that is somebody who is working out the ways of thinking under the influence of the more than human earth. Um, my particular fascinations, and in some ways what I'm really known for, is my work uh, first on the ecology of perception, or what we could call the ecology of sensory experience, the way the activity of our animal senses, of our eyes, of our ears, of our skin, even our nostrils, functions to bind our separate nervous systems into the surrounding ecosystem, wherever we find ourselves, as though perception itself was like a glue um, that, yes, uh, connects, uh, binds us, binds our individual nervous systems in with the wider uh, ecosystem, uh, wherever we dwell. But I am also just as fascinated with what we could call the ecology of language. How what we say so profoundly influences what we see or what we hear or even taste of the earth around us. Because I'm convinced that there are many ways of speaking that um, most of us uh, have inherited from the various uh, um, modern civilizations that we inhabit or were educated into, ways of speaking that actually frustrate and stifle that instinctive reciprocity between our animal senses and the earthly sensuous, this sensorial terrain around us. But I'm just as convinced that there exist other ways of speaking waiting for us, ways of wielding our words that actually encourage and enhance that spontaneous rapport or, yes, reciprocity between the human body and the breathing earth around us. And I'm always looking for um, such simple ways of speaking that bring a large gestalt shift, that is, that bring a, a, a dramatic change in the way we are perceiving the earth around us. Um, for a simple example, I'll say that at least here in uh, the West, in North America, we hear a great deal about how we live on the earth, um, that this is happening on the earth or that is um, that uh, across the face of the earth, um, such events are now unfolding here on earth. Um, yeah, in fact, the most uh, um, environmental 
public radio program that is a national program across the whole of the country is called Living on Earth. Um, so we hear all the time that we exist on the earth, um, uh, but I, I really want to ask, really? I mean, is this true? Do we live on the earth? I mean, consider the fact that, um, that uh, the earth is spinning very, very rapidly around its axis, as we all know, uh, at um, a very high speed. Um, if I speak in miles, it's, it's spinning uh, close to 2,000 miles an hour around near the equator. Here, where I live, it's closer to just 1,000 miles an hour or 900 miles an hour. Uh, I'm not sure what it would be in Hong Kong. And so sometimes I take my um, folks that I'm working with or students whom I'm teaching, and I take them out uh, out onto the land under the sky and have them look up at the clouds uh, floating overhead. Now, if the earth is really spinning that rapidly toward the east, I say, look at those clouds. Shouldn't we see all those clouds just whipping off toward the west like that? But they're not speeding off toward the west. In fact, today, the clouds here were just very lazily drifting toward the north and very, very slowly uh, doing that. Sometimes they're drifting toward the east, sometimes toward the south or the west. Um, but if the Earth is spinning so rapidly on its axis, surely we should be seeing all those clouds running very rapidly toward the West. Not running, but actually zooming off toward the West. And I ask my students, why don't we see that? How come the clouds are just lollygagging up there in the sky, floating so lazily? And usually, one um, um, perspicacious student will pipe up um, or two or three and say, well, it's obvious. It's because those clouds up there are accompanying the earth as it spins, which of course is correct because those clouds are held aloft by earth's atmosphere by this invisible fluid medium of air that stretches from the soil underfoot up to those clouds and beyond those clouds, many, many, a hundred miles up past those clouds. And the atmosphere is carrying those clouds and turning with the earth because the atmosphere is a part of the earth. And so those clouds are turning toward the east just as the earth itself is turning, which is to say that we don't live on the earth. We live in the earth. We live down here, submerged in this ocean of atmosphere, as thoroughly as fish are immersed in the sea. We live down here in the depths of this invisible fluid element we call Earth's atmosphere. We live not on, but in the Earth, or sometimes, as I call it in English, the Earth. I, I sometimes spell our planet E-A-I-R-T-H. I take the letter I and I put it in the middle of our name for the planet Earth in order to say that I, the self in English, I is our, is our letter, our word for speaking of the self, to say that I am in the air, A-I-R. And the air is entirely a part of the earth, E-A-I-R-T-H. Because consider a bit more something I'm sure by now that most of you have noticed 
and perhaps reflected upon, but that I never really thought about um, in my first two, three decades of life. That, of course, there'd be no oxygen for us animals to breathe if it were not being exhaled by all of the green and rooted plants, um, the grasses, the wildflowers, the shrubs and bushes and trees, indeed the whole forests that surround me here where I live, all breathing out the oxygen that all us animals need to take in for our, for our respiratory metabolism. And so we inhale this invisible fluid, this oxygenated air, and we circulate it within us. We draw it into our lungs and spread it out through our limbs, circulating it through our muscles. And then we alchemize it within our limbs and breathe it out, now transformed, infused with carbon dioxide, which is the very ingredient that all those green and growing plants need for their photosynthetic metabolism. So what we animals breathe out, all the plants are breathing in. And what the plants breathe out, all us animals are breathing in. Talk about reciprocity. It's this exquisite instance of pure reciprocity tucked into the very heart of the present moment. The very heart of our breathing, this rocking in and out of ourselves that we take so much for granted that we often don't even notice it. And yet it speaks of our uttermost entwinement, interdependence with all these plants, all these leafing and needled trees, all these wildflowers. And it turns out that the atmosphere of this planet is not just a bunch of gases that happen to be drawn down to Earth and held here around the Earth by Earth's gravity, but rather that this atmosphere is born of the interbreathing of all us animals with the plants, with the soils, with the oceans, all of us exchanging breath with one another gradually percolates and bubbles into existence this earthly atmosphere, this elixir, this magic yet invisible membrane that we call the air. In fact, it was this strange brew of chemicals, of gases, that led James Lovelock uh, to theorize the very first uh, uh, insights into what he came to speak of as the Gaia hypothesis. The Gaia hypothesis originally was born of Lovelock's recognition that, good heavens, the chemical composition of Earth's atmosphere is very far from equilibrium. It has gases in various proportions in, with one another that should be canceling each other out and coming to a very different equilibrium. And yet it stays in this very far from equilibrium composition. And that led Lovelock to realize that the atmosphere was being not just generated, but monitored and modulated by all of the living beings on Earth's surface, breathing together, interbreathing with one another. And yes, I do think that uh, this beautiful word that we were taught by the wonderful Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh, one of my teachers, interbeing, a word that we many of us find indispensable when we speak of how 
I and you inter are with one another. The world is filled um, with beings that inter are. Interbeing is our, is our um, way of living in exchange with each other. But I think we need to supplement his word interbeing with this, with this other word, interbreathing, that we animals are interbreathing with the plants, interbreathing with one another and with the soils and with the oceans. So uh, that's, I've just taken a long while to say something very simple, that we don't live on the earth, but that we live in the earth or in the earth, in this breathing mystery. Um, I do have, as I was suggesting, this deep concern with sensory experience, with perception. And my fascination with the ecology of sensory experience stems from my work many years ago in my uh, early 20s, um, traveling as an itinerant sleight of hand magician. Um, sleight of hand, well, I hope that the uh, interpreters, translators are able to uh, translate that phrase sleight of hand. It's um, another word that we have in English for conjuring. Um, if I had a coin, let me see if I have one nearby. Um, yeah, here's a simple, uh, an American half dollar. And uh, sleight of hand is the craft by which one works with a coin or a stone or even a bird um, or a leaf and working gently with one's fingers and simple ways of moving one's fingers can help that coin to vanish, to reappear, to transform into a sphere. Um, I'm not going to do this over the camera because it doesn't work very well online. You, it's, it, it's powerful when it happens right in front of your nose um, or in your hands. But this was my profession for many years was that of a sleight of hand magician. I performed throughout North America um, in clubs and restaurants, working table to table, sometimes doing these minor miracles for people. But at a certain point, I took off traveling as an itinerant sleight of hand magician through Southeast Asia, through Indonesia, through Nepal and the Himalayas, through Sri Lanka, looking to meet the traditional magicians or medicine people or sorcerers who practiced their medicinal craft in the small village backwaters in those countries. Um, I was traveling not outwardly as a researcher or as an anthropologist, but just as a magician in my own right, hoping that my craft at sleight of hand magic would pique the interest of um, some of these traditional magicians or traditional sorcerers or shamans. And in fact, this was very successful. My secret aim in this research was to study the uses of magic in medicine, in folk medicine, in curing, to see how these medicine women and medicine men were able to use uh, magic in various forms to heal people who were sick or ailing in various strong and intense ways. And like I say, this was very successful. Um, and the magicians or these bizarre individuals who I came to meet and to um, spend time with these exceedingly bizarre individuals called dukuns in Indonesia and called zankris in Nepal. Um, they were fascinated to encounter someone from the West, someone uh, with white skin who actually had some interchange with the spirits, 
who was able also to work with the invisible realms. And I was invited into their homes and asked to trade secrets with them and ultimately asked to participate in their ceremonies and curing rituals. And I got in way over my head. But what I wanted to share with you guys is that in the course of living with these folks, my interests began to shift dramatically because here I thought I was interested in their work as healers, but I gradually came to recognize that these medicine people who were the healers for many villages in their vicinity were, they understood themselves and their craft as healers to be a kind of byproduct of their more primary role or function within their communities. And a clue to that more primary role would be found in the fact that these folks never live in the middle of their villages. They always live out at the edge of the community or just inside the forest. Or in Nepal, they would live out beyond the village in a cluster of wild boulders places where the villagers themselves would not even venture at night because they were too sakti or too powerful. But the magicians always made their home there at that edge, at the margin of the community. Because as it turned out, the traditional magician's style of intelligence or awareness is not encompassed within the uh, human, uh, exclusively human goings on within the, the settlement or the village, but its place, his place, her place is always at the edge, mediating between the human world and the more than human world of powers, of beings, uh, within which the human community is embedded. Now, by the more than human world, I don't actually mean anything supernatural. I mean the community that includes us two-legged, two-legged animals, but includes as well all of the other walking and crawling and slithering animals that live in the terrain, as well as uh, the flapping, flying, squawking, feathered folks who swoop by uh, overhead and sometimes shit on our heads and um, humble us in that way. Um, but also all of the uh, swimming peoples that live in the waters around the islands of Indonesia, the finned peoples, we could call them. Um, um, but not just the other animals, but also the trees, the bushes, clumps of grasses, wildflowers, yes, but also all the trees and even forests themselves were assumed to be alive, awake, and deeply aware. But not just the other animals and the plants, but also the mountains, the rivers, dry riverbeds were assumed to have their own awareness. Um, even the winds and the weather patterns were felt to be alive and sentient. The clouds, storm clouds, very much so. In fact, anything that we can sense with our animal senses were assumed to be sensitive and even sentient in their own right. Everything we can sense was assumed to be a sensitive, sentient power or being. Everything alive. And the magicians, it turned out, were simply those folks who were most susceptible to the calls and cries of these other than human shapes of awareness. The magicians were the intermediaries, those who, who tended the boundary between the human world and the wider more than human collective of animate life. So what I'm really saying here um, 
is that the magicians in any traditional culture were the sensitives, the empaths, the very poorest people uh, within any community. It seems that there is a number of uh, persons inevitably who are a little more porous than the others. Um, they feel things a little more intensely. In fact, um, there are probably uh, a number of such people uh, listening in on this um, on this podcast right now. Uh, you probably know who you are, but folks who just, well, other people percolate through you. Um, you can be at a party uh, speaking to some folks in a corner and someone enters into the big room at the other end of the room. You're not even looking at them, but they are so excited because they just got a raise at work and they're just filled with, with a, a kind of unexpected joy. And you start feeling this elation moving through your own muscles. And uh, there's a, now a new bounce to your own body as you sit there in conversation with the others you're talking to. Or maybe somebody else comes into the room all dejected and depressed because she just broke up with her boyfriend of several years and you start feeling kind of morose and sad and gloomy without quite knowing why. Because other people percolate through you. You can't help but feel what other people feel. And in fact, in, in a very modern culture, at least like that here in North America, um, folks who have this kind of extra porosity um, or extra sensitivity uh, uh, get in a lot of trouble because it's not really good for anything in a culture that assumes that only humans are really awake and aware and conscious. And the rest of the world is basically inert, inanimate, or at least mechanically determinate. Um, because the thing is, this kind of sensitivity, this kind of porosity is a bit too much for hanging out with other nervous systems that are shaped just like yourself. You can't help but feel everything that they're feeling or a lot of what they're feeling. And it's kind of uh, too much to deal with. But in a healthy culture, in a culture that knows that not just humans, but everything is alive, awake, and aware in its own way, in its own style, often very different from our style, well, this kind of sensitivity is actually quite useful. It's quite functional and very practical for the community because it's too much for hanging out with other nervous systems shaped just like your own, but it's just right for entering into some kind of communication with a frog or with a spider or with an octopus or a humpback whale, or an earthworm, or a swallow swooping past, or an oak tree, or a pine tree, or a clump of sagebrush, or even a storm cloud. And so this becomes your charge, your responsibility in a healthy culture. Folks with this kind of extra sensitivity quite naturally as they're growing up, they, they find they're not very comfortable in the middle of the human hubbub. It's too much. It blows out their circuits over and over again. So even as you're growing up, you gradually gravitate toward the edge of the community where with one hand, you can be in relation to the human goings on, but with your other hand, you're in relation to the forest and to all the other shapes of sensitivity and sentience that compose the forest. And so by the time you're in your late teens or twenties, 
you are recognized within the human community as having that function, that role of being an intermediary. I hope this makes some kind of sense to you folks. It's probably obvious to, to those of you who've thought about it, but it was entirely new to me when I first began to understand that the, the magicians, the medicine people in traditional tribal cultures uh, were folks who, yes, had the ability to cure, to heal other people, but that was because they were always tending the larger relationship between the human world and the more than human world. Because illness in traditional cultures is understood as a kind of imbalance, a disequilibrium, a dis-ease. But the source of this disequilibrium is not in the person, nor even in the person's relation to his family or even to her wider human community. Its source of this disequilibrium always lies in the relation between the human world and the largest system that it's a part of, between the human community and the more than human community. So if a particular magician was um, only working as a healer and not tending this wider uh, craft, this wider equilibrium between the human world and the more than human earth, then he might just be focused on curing people who come to him for ritual aid. And so he might really help this person feel a lot better, but then someone else will fall sick in the community. So he'll help that person feel better. Someone else will fall sick with the same illness perhaps. So then he'll work hard using his craft to eradicate that illness from the community. Another illness will turn up because the source of the illness or disequilibrium lies in that wider relation with the animate earth itself, with the living landscape, with the land. So um, that's one thought I wanted to just float here. It's very simple. And I'm trying to speak um, slowly and as simply as I can so that the translators don't have too hard uh, a project uh, translating my words. But what else can I say um, to just uh, open up a wider conversation here? Uh, two two simple things that it seems to me I was speaking of our senses, our eyes, our ears, our skin, our nostrils, our taste buds. It seems to me that sensory experience is inherently participatory. Um, uh, we hide from this when we think and speak of ourselves as pure minds or pure spirits or pure subjects experiencing a world of objects. Um, because then perception can only be a one directional thing uh, whereby uh, information from the objective world out there uh, is transferred by my senses into my nervous system where it is read uh, or uh, synthesized by my self or spirit or mind. But if we drop that whole way of thinking and allow what seems much more obvious, which is that we are ourselves objective, thingful, palpable, sensible bodies interacting with spiders and grass blades and weather systems and mountains and rivers. That is, we are one thing among many other things. 
we are bodies among bodies of many different shapes and styles, well, then we notice that perception is a participation. It's an interaction that my hand, which I use to explore all the tangible tactile surfaces around me, the bark of trees, the smooth surface of rocks and boulders. Well, this hand has its own smooth surfaces, its own calloused textures, its own um, roughnesses and smooth aspect. So when I walk over to uh, an aspen tree and begin to reach out and touch the bark, I'm not just touching the tree and feeling its textures. I'm also the feeling the tree touching me, feeling my textures, sampling the chemistry of my skin. The sense of touch has this curious reciprocity to it, but not just the sense of touch. Let me just mention one other sense, our eyes with which we gaze out at the visible shapes of things, the colors of things. These eyes have their own visibility. Uh, they have their own color. In my case, a kind of greenish brown. They have their shiny surface, like the surface of a leaf or of a pond. And so when I wake up in the morning and come over and open the door, to my home and gaze out at the forested hillside across from me, I'm not just seeing those trees over there on that hillside. I'm also feeling myself seen by that hillside. I'm feeling my own visibility. I'm feeling myself watched, noticed, seen by all those needled and leafing beings there. Perception is this exchange, this interweaving, this reciprocity between our body and the breathing body of the world itself and all the other bodies around us. But we hide from this when we speak of the world as a set of objects or when we speak of nature as a set of objective mechanical processes, because there's no way to reciprocate an inanimate object or to enter into reciprocal relationship with a machine. There's, the machine can't respond to me. It, it can't creatively engage or respond to my, to my actions toward it. And so when we speak of the world just as a set of objects, our eyes tend to glaze over. Our ears become deaf to everything that does not speak in words. It's very difficult for our senses to encounter and live into a world that is conceived as a set of objects. It's never perceived as a set of objects because we can't see that way. We can't hear that way. We can't touch the world that way. And so when we speak of the world in these purely inert or inanimate or mechanical ways, we tend to withdraw from our senses and live more and more in our heads and live inside just a play of words. But as soon as we allow into our speaking that everything we see is also sensitive, sentient, that the things we touch are also touching us back, then our senses begin to open. We find ourselves living more in our bodies and we begin to feel our body, not as an object, but as a magical breathing, thinking, speaking power. And so we find ourselves alive inside a world that is itself alive. And we notice that this body, this two-armed, two-legged form, is just our small body, and the earth is our larger flesh, this huge spherical metabolism in which our individual physiologies are all entangled.
And I think with that, I'll just stop and say, let's have a conversation about any anything I've said or anything I've written or whatever this sparks in you folks. I haven't, I hope I haven't said things too simply and too um too uh foolishly here. Um but let's have a conversation. Great. Thank you, David. And um, we actually have already three questions that have come. So I feel that the, the dialogue has, has begun, um, where people already feel like we are responding to what you were sharing. And so I'll share the three questions and then, because, uh, and then you can see I think they're all related. So the first one is more on the magician, the experience of the, the magic and the magician. And how does that relate to, is that related to changing people's perception? For example, how do those relate? Um, and then the next question is on animals' perceptions. If all animals have perceptions of their own, for example, an octopus. Yes. And the third question, and then I'll pause, is how can we enhance our senses and be more participatory? So the magician, and is that working with people's perception, the animals' perceptions, if they have perceptions of their own, and how can we enhance our senses and be more participatory? Oh, wow. Okay, those are three very different questions. Um, so let me just start in on the first one, and then maybe you can remind me of the others. Yes, um, yes, sure. But I didn't get the, the question wasn't so clear. It was, how does the work of the magician connect to... Um, this matter of perception? Um, do, do yes, it's a, it's a, so Simon is asking how is that, it, does it refer to working on changing people's perception? What is the magician, the magic that okay. you refer to? If maybe well, speak more on the, on the experience of the magician and how that relates well, to perception. Okay, so some people think that, um, uh, and it's quite, natural, I suppose, to think that a contemporary sleight of hand conjurer or um, sleight of hand magician working, performing in clubs or on stages um, is a very different thing from traditional indigenous um, magic or uh, the practice of the shaman or the sorcerer. Um, um, because we're speaking of, of folks who think of themselves as illusionists and just doing, uh, creating illusions of magic on a stage. Whereas a traditional indigenous shaman is actually working or understands herself to be working uh, magic itself. And if she's successful in healing someone, well, that's pretty real and pretty practical. And it's not just a form of entertainment. Um, okay, let me respond to that by saying, actually, these are not very different things at all. Whether we're speaking of a contemporary sleight of hand conjurer or a traditional indigenous medicine person or sorcerer, we're speaking of people who work with the very fluid medium of perception itself. Perception is the medium of a magician, just as pigments and colors are the medium of a painter, or musical notes and tones are the medium for a musician or a pianist. For a magician, perception is the very medium in which she works or he works. Magicians are those who are adept at shifting, at altering the, uh, the very fluid and malleable texture of perception. So these are not so different. Um, when I perform sleight of hand magic, what I'm really doing is I'm using my various uh, uh, hand gestures or mudras, we could call them, um, to um, interrupt and um, 
yes, to interrupt the expected uh, uh, trajectory of a coin, of an object, of a stone that I'm working with. Um, and suddenly it vanishes and then it reappears in, a, in another place. Or I can put, take a rock and push it through my head and pull it out of my mouth. And this is so startling to our senses. What the magician is doing is actually activating the creative, creative participatory quality of sensory experience itself. I, in, if I'm working with a coin, like I was showing you a little earlier, moving it through my hand and then um, letting it vanish and reappear, what I'm really doing is just um, opening up gaps in the trajectory of the coin and your senses, your eyes spontaneously, gregariously fill in those gaps. And that's what creates the magic, the experience of the coin floating from one place to another or changing color or turning into a sphere um, is created by the senses of everyone who is watching and participating in the magic. What magic does, even contemporary sleight of hand magic, is um, the magician wakes our senses up from their static, stuck ways of perceiving so that we actually start seeing the world more as it really is, seeing the world more creatively, more participatively, more richly, more reciprocally. So um, that's trying to say a lot in a very short space, but I hope it makes some little bit of sense. Um, now, the thing is, to take up the second question, we are not the only animals doing this. Every animal has its set of senses, although for many creatures, their senses are quite different from ours. Although many animals have a sense of sight, their eyes are sometimes way different from our eyes. They're sensitive to many more colors than us or to fewer colors, or they have compound eyes that show them multiple images of the world, not just two. Well, we have two eyes, but we fuse those two images into a single image. But imagine how different that is for a deer or a horse whose eyes are on opposite sides of its very big nose. And so they can't focus the eyes together. So there's two images of the world that they're always sort of navigating between. And then, of course, other animals have whole other arrangements of eyes and of ears or of feelingful senses that take the place of what for us are ears, but they feel it as deep sort of rhythmic rumblings that they pick up through their feet as elephants do who also have very big flapping ears but it turns out they can hear things far below the threshold of our hearing through their feet through the ground itself they pick up vib vibrations that start many many miles away so each animal each organism has its own range and array of senses and um it's it's a wonderful rich uh world of discovery as you even just wander through the land each being you come upon to reflect upon how does it feel the world here's a tree an apple tree who must be sensing the world because it responds it's able to send its roots through the soil in search of moisture. And when it feels moisture in one area, it grows those roots and the roots stretch, the rootlets stretch more richly through the soil. But even as it is doing that, its leaves are reaching up and tracking the sun as the sun is slowly moving across the sky. The leaves are, as it were, eating that fire in the sky or drinking in that sunlight and transmuting it into flesh, into sugars that become the musculature of that branch, that tree trunk, those leaves. 
imagine what it would be to be eating fire, eating sunlight, while with your toes, you're slurping up water from the ground. And so constantly moving sunlight down through your body while you're transmuting and moving moisture up through your body. This double movement all the time. Each plant is engaged in something like that. And yet each plant is different from all the others. So really feeling with your senses into the different sensorium of other animals, of plants. This is such a delight. And it makes any walk in the woods or through the meadow a kind of phantasmagoria, like a psychedelic experience, except you don't have to eat any mushrooms or smoke anything. You just have to allow that it's all alive. It's all alive. It's just each thing is alive in its own way, interestingly different from the way you are alive. But this body, the human animal form, is our access to all those other shapes of sensitivity and perception and experience, because we have our own senses and our own animal form. And I can use this body to reverberate, to pick up an echo from any other body that I encounter. I can feel into and suss out something of what it feels because my body is a variant of every other body in the sensorial terrain. Likewise, any other body that I see, that mountain, the patch of lichen spreading on the boulder is a variation of me. It has all sorts of things in common with me, not just because we share common biotic ancestors, but because we're parts of the same breathing biosphere, interdependent, complementary aspects of the same common metabolism. Um, so just, I've already implied a lot, but just to, to mention that last question, how do we open our animal senses? The first simplest thing I would say is just allow that it's all alive, that it's all aware, that everything you see is a sensitive, sentient being. Not that it's sensing the world in the same way you are. It's way different from you. And yet it's still feeling, sensing, responding to the space around it, to the other beings around it, perhaps even responding to you. As soon as you allow this, into your thinking and into your speaking, notice if your eyes suddenly become much more awake to all the nuances in the visual field, that your ears start picking up many, many more sounds in the, in the earthly soundscape as you're walking, because suddenly those sounds are not just meaningless noise, there are voices. Any sound can be a voice. Even thudder, the big, the big voice, the big word at the origin of the world. I mean, that's how a lot of other animals experience it and how many of our ancestors experienced thunder as a voice, of course. And what is it saying? What, what, what do you pick up from that? What does your body take in as meaning from that? Thrum, tumble, rumble, voice in, 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 in the sky, or the babbling speech of a brook, um, or bird song as it filters down through the branches and the leaves, or cricket rhythms. Any sound can be a voice, just as any movement can be experienced as a gesture laden with meaning. And it's like, well, wait a minute. The movement of those grasses as the wind is blowing through them, that's not a gesture. Those grasses are not saying anything. They're not saying, well, wait a minute. Really consult your animal body. And you notice that you pick up lots of meaningful richness when the, when the, the wind is gusting through those grasses and they're bending. You're picking up all sorts of information 
about the wind, for one thing. And the grasses are helping convey that information to your animal body. Just as when you speak, when we humans speak, the meaning is not just there in the dictionary definitions of our words, much of the meaning of my speaking, even here through the internet, lives in the sound of my speaking, bada ba ba da dinking, in the sound or the music and the rise and fall of my voice as I'm gesturing here and speaking to you folks. And your animal bodies are picking up something from the melody, that very awkward melody of my speaking, ba da da awkward, ba da dee ba da beaking, that I'm singing at you here. And so that, you know, other animals, they don't, they don't read dictionaries. They can't get the, the denotative dictionary meaning of the words when I'm walking through the world, if I'm speaking to somebody else, but they get the sound spell of my words. Other animals can pick up the rhythm, the feel of my words, if I'm speaking as a full-bodied creature and not just speaking with abstract sort of abstract highfalutin terminology that I picked up at the university that you sort of have to be a, a, a fancy pants, super educated doctor or scientist to understand those words that no longer have any feel or music to them. So I think last thing I'll say here, and then let's hear some more questions. If we really want to, open up and come into richer relation with the local earth around us, wherever we are. We need to start speaking a little differently. How? Well, just start paying attention to the sound of your speaking, to the rhythm of your speaking. That's what good poets do. That's what poetry does. It helps us notice that words have shape, that words, different words taste differently on our tongue. And so paying attention to that and speaking as a body, which is what you really are to other fully embodied animals, which is what we are. And that way, anybody you're talking to has to drop down from their fancy convoluted mind into the rest of their body to understand what you're saying. And as they do so, they become more present to the crickets more present to the spiders, more present to the aspen trees and the pine trees. And the pine trees start noticing them more because, ah, these people are becoming creaturely again. They are becoming of this earth rather than letting their language hold them aloof from the earth, hovering outside it as if we were just disembodied minds looking upon the earth as spectators looking at a spectacle. It's time to stop that way of speaking entirely. And the simplest way to do that is to pay attention to the sound spell of our, of our words, to the music of our speaking. <laughs> what a long answer to those three questions. I hope it's made some kind of goofy sense. Yes. And I think, um, well, it did to me, and I, uh, we have an, another comment and question that I think you've answered um, from Janine. And well, first she says, how wonderful if we could be in person experiencing uh, your magic, the sleight of hand magic. And then she says, she asks if this sensuousness is available for gifted persons such as the magicians um, or for everyone? And I, my, I think you've just really eloquently answered how that's available for all of us, for everyone, for all- Well, wait a moment. Let me respond yeah. directly to that to say, um, I do feel I'm convinced from my life and researches um, that have gone on for many decades now that um, some people, that everybody has this capacity, but there are some folks, um, and the earth has made sure that in any human community, there are individuals 
maybe as much as 20% of the population in any population that are extra sensitive in this way, that are really empathic or have this very porous style, at least 10% of any population that tends in this direction. Um, um, now, the thing is, it's not always just a blessing to be like this. It's uh, actually very confusing and painful. And if you grow up in a culture or a civilization that thinks that the rest of nature is basically a set of objects, well, this sensitivity is not good for anything. And it just gets you in trouble. And so um, you uh, tend to uh, get locked up <laughs> in, um, in jail or in a psychiatric hospital or in the zoo or in, um, or you lock yourself up and inside yourself. And then you wake up when you're 40 years old or 50. And it's like, oh, where have I been all my life? Um, but in a healthy culture that knows that everything is alive, this, con this sensitivity is very functional because you need such folks to tend the boundary between the human world and the more than human world to keep the boundary porous, to keep it a membrane across which there's a two-way flow that the human community never takes more from the land than it returns to the land, whether with prayers, propitiations, offerings, prayers, um, and um, praises, praising the earth, the other animals, the plants, the weather powers. Um, um, this becomes the magician's role. It's, it's really the role of the ecologist to be always balancing the relation between the human gang and the more than human collective. Um, the thing is, these folks are useless in the middle of the human hubbub. They are not very helpful um, if they live in the middle of the city. They're hopeless as a mayor, for instance. Never elect a person like this as a mayor or your, your city will fall into a shambles because such folks need to be in direct relation with the, the wider, more than human terrain. The human world is too similar to their own nervous system. And so they pick up so much from other humans all the time. It blows out their, their organism and uh, it, they go bonkers. Uh, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm not gonna elaborate anymore, but just to say, as long as such sensitives are fulfilling their responsibility, that is are tending the boundary between the human world and the more than human world, as long as they are doing that work, then everyone within the community begins to feel more porous, more attuned, more uh, alive to the wider more than human earth, to the winds and the weather patterns, to the waters coursing through the community. Everybody uh, becomes a little more sensitive and porous because those folks are doing the work that is their responsibility for the community. I hope that makes sense. Okay, I That's saw Jenny nodding. <laughs> she nodded. And, oh, good. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think two questions um, that connect, I think, to the, the, the challenge then of living with our senses in modernity, which is related to technology. So Paula is asking, King, um, do you think the modern technologies have impaired our abilities of sensing the world? And then just very related to that, Kai, Kai Wen um, also, well, he says, first, your voice in Hong Kong is a wonderful gift. Thank you. And also um, asking about the techno, techno soliquo quai. It's the first time I hear this word, so I probably didn't pronounce that well, which I asked him. Techno soliquo, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so is that, um, does that amputate our sensorial relations with the earth and the many beings? Um, so are we forgetting our fellow beings by staring at screens 
and um, ignoring the reality around us. So does the internet and social media amplify um, that techno so liquid? Wait, or uh, do you have grounds for do we have grounds for hope? I think there's always grounds for hope if our hearts are still beating. Boy, what an eloquently framed question. I suspect that that's from my mysterious brother, Kevin, there in Hong Kong. Um, but beautiful, beautiful question in any case. Um, 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 both questions um, in relation to technology. Of course, if I'm uh, suggesting that to our animal body, everything is alive, that means everything. That means um, not just our earthborn presences, but also houses, automobiles, uh, um, 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 the smooth asphalt of the city street, uh, the computer, um, the, uh, the strange metallic alloy uh, in my car door, everything uh, has its dynamism. It's not entirely inanimate or inert. Um, that's why it's able to affect or infect the world around it and spread sometimes its toxins into the world and sicken things because it has agency, because it has power. Um, but our technologies, yes, as both of those fine questions um, intimate, our technologies, um, particularly the very rich and complicated technologies so many of us wield today, including that which you're using to, uh, to speak and to hear me, and that I'm using to speak and hear you guys. Um, this uh, incredibly complex thing we call the computer and the internet. Um, it's, it's worth realizing that all these tools originate as ways to help us relate more intimately, relate better to the uh, sensorial surroundings, to the other animals, to the plants, to the earthly sensuous. We developed tools to help us engage that world more richly and fully. But then we gradually, over the course of history, uh, become so fascinated with the tools themselves as we give them more bells and whistles and make them work yet more efficiently. We become so fascinated with this tool that, whoa, well, I start relating to the tool itself and begin to forget what the tool was connecting me to. It's now the tool that carries that fascination. And it's kind of dazzling. And let me just gaze this screen fitted thingamabob even more intensely and keep it with me all the time in my pocket. In fact, I'd like to have two, three, 10 iPhones around me all the time so that I can be captured by them. And rapidly, the more than human terrain just falls by the wayside. It falls beyond the horizon of our awareness, not just for those who have 10 different cell phones, but even those who have just one are spending so much time on their cell phone now that they're not even noticing the breathing world around them that speaks in so many other nonverbal ways. But lots of our technologies do this, of course, not just those with screens, which are today the, sort of the most fascinating ones, but it has something to do with fascination. It has something to do with, with the fact that when we speak of these as tools or even as technologies, we pretend that uh, they just serve practical, uh, rational purposes for us. But in fact, from our old indigenous animistic perspective, even from our animal bodily perspective, these are magics. Each technology is like a form of magic. That's why it has always a more than rational effect upon us. Um, 
And this stretches way back even to some of our earliest or way older technologies like writing itself or the alphabet. It casts a kind of spell upon us when we learn to read and write with uh, an alphabet or with kanji or with uh, the beautiful Chinese ideographic writing system. Uh, each writing system captures the focus of our eyes and returns us to ourselves in a different way, reflects us back to ourselves in a uniquely strange and different way. But prior to the written word, it was the land that spoke to us. It was the bend in the river. It was the gurgling speech of a creek. It was the wind gusting through the branches and the leaves that spoke to us. Um, but once we take up the written word, it's like, whoa, the page of the book now speaks as vividly as the landscape once spoke. And in fact, I become so fascinated by what's written in the books. And now with what's written on the computer screen that the land itself begins to seem mute. It no longer speaks. It no longer dances and captures my fascination. So yes, I do think that our technologies have usurped that um, co-evolved capacity and fascination that our senses once had for the whole of the earthly sensuous. It's been usurped by the kind of dazzlement of the digital screen, of even the page, of even of so many of the other gadgets that now grip us and hold us in a kind of thrall. And we've lost our gifts for engaging the world directly. Anything you can do in your life to turn off the screen once in a while, to leave your phone out of play when you go for a hike in the forest or in the mountains, to open your senses back up to the earthly sensuous. Anything that you can do that steps in that direction is an ecological action that returns you to your own animal inheritance in the animate earth and opens your communicative capacity, your ability to communicate and be communicated with, spoken to by the land and spoken through by the land around you. Great question. So much more to say on that. But I'll stop there for now. We have so many questions uh, bubbling and we are, I'm afraid we are closing our talk, oh. but I, I did think maybe we answered last one. So we have the, the experience of going through the um, last oh. question. And it's hard, it's been hard to choose uh, so many questions. Um, but uh, one from Kishi, and I'm sorry for probably um, mispronouncing the, the, the sound of your name. And um, he or she is asking, the question has been translated. Um, are there human ghosts in non-human existence besides animals or plants or rocks or clouds? And also you spoke of the healers, so also from Kishi, uh, healing in the um, healers living in the edge of their communities and also healing in a linguistic way. What is, can you say more of this linguistic approach? Maybe we can- What, what yes. was the first part of the question, the first part about- ghosts? Yes, the, the, are there human ghosts in non-human? So this question was translated also. So I was interested in the, in the word ghosts. So are there human ghosts? So I don't know if ghosts could also mean spirits. Um, yes. in non-human existence besides animals or plants or rocks or clouds. And then the, and then the rest of the, the rest of the question was. Uh, also around the, the healers living at the edge of their communities. And also do they heal in a linguistic way? In what way is the linguistic, the, the language coming into the healers work? Okay. Um, um that's a lot. That's a lot to to maybe five minutes that we have to close. Okay. Well, I'll just take those few minutes to touch on this. If we speak of 
ghosts, if we speak of spirits, um, so often in the modern world, at least in the highly educated modern world here in North America, um, people tend to think we are speaking of supernatural powers outside of the body's world that exist outside of nature. Um, but what I want to say is that for our indigenous uh, ancestors, and let's remember we all have our indigenous ancestry, and that for 99% of our human tenure in the biosphere, we lived as hunters and gatherers and foragers in a very animistic relation to the whole local more than human earth for our indigenous ancestors and for our indigenous brothers and sisters today who still live around us and among us. Um, the spirits are not of another world. They are not outside of the body's world entirely. Sometimes, yes, there is something uh, uh, very hard to grasp, um, but even our word spirit, in English, the word spirit comes from the Latin spiritus, which originally meant a breath or a gust of wind. When the native peoples of this continent speak of the spirits, we mistakenly think they're speaking of disembodied powers. When they're speaking of the spirits, they're, they're speaking of powers in the air, in the wind, in the breath. And so this conversation comes full circle to where I started. The spirits are not elsewhere. They are not of another world. They are the way this world speaks and moves and engages us when our animal senses are really awake. There are aspects of the sensorial world, the palpable world, that are invisible. We cannot see them directly. But that doesn't mean they are not right here. The invisible is just like the word says. It is in the visible. In fact, if the air itself, the breath, this interbreathing mystery we were speaking of at the beginning, if it were not invisible, the air, we wouldn't see anything else. <laughs> because the air is that through which we see one another through which you see uh, the clump of sagebrush or that cloud overhead or the moon or your dog uh, you know, barking at you. Um, it's all reaching you through the air and you can see your dog because the air is invisible. But if the air was not invisible, it would stop up our gaze and we wouldn't see anything else. So our world is made of invisibility. The visible world itself is filled with invisibility, the invisibility even of the air and the spirits, the powers, the voices that inhabit this invisible mysterium we call the atmosphere. So also in regard to this magic of language to just allow that when you speak, it's also the air, the wind, the breath of the earth itself speaking through you. Have you noticed that when we speak, we only speak on the out breath. We never speak on the in breath because it doesn't sound good. It's very hard to speak when you're breathing in. We speak by inhaling some of this invisible stuff we call air, and we drink some of it in, and we circulate it within us, and then we breathe it out. And as we breathe it out, we let it vibrate a couple folds in our throat, and we shape it with our lips and our teeth and our palate and our tongue, and we sound our words out into the air. And so our ancestors, our indigenous sisters and brothers all know that it is the air that is carrying my words to your ears at the moment and carrying your words to my ear. That is 
The air is the implicit intermediary in all communication. It's the first medium when we speak of the media uh, and, and the fancy media we use today, like the internet, all derive from the original medium of communication, which is the air, which is the breath, which is the spirit. So your questioner asked about human ghosts or spirits, but let's recognize, as we were sharing at the beginning, that the air is born of the interbreathing between us humans with all the other animals and all us animals interbreathing with the plants and all the animals and the plants interbreathing with the soils and with the oceans. So there's never just human ghosts, but the world we live in is filled with ghosts, ghosts of oak trees and frogs and gray whales and octopus. Ghosts, breath everywhere, and the ghosts of your ancestors still present in the air around you. That's why when my grandmother passed on, suddenly she was everywhere. And I could speak with her much easier than having to go visit her down in Florida or even pick up the phone to call her. So now she's in the air all around me, just here, and I could speak with her. So um, there's something deeply true and poetically true about all of these mythopoetic, mythopoetic ways of understanding the earthly material world. It's not a set of objects. It's alive. It's filled with life. And practice finding your ways of speaking that allow that life that let the world come alive for you. Thank you all so much for um, hanging with me through this, this pleasurable and goofy conversation. It's a delight to be with you all. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. And it's uh, really that tingling sense that the conversation is full of life and could go on and on and on. And it's wonderful to actually end with that feeling. Um, that something will go on. And I really encourage all of you to go through David's books if you haven't, and um, there are many talks available. Um, oh, yes, on, yes. And I'll just yeah. say, not just the book you named at first, The Spell of yeah. the Centuries, but also this book, Becoming Animal, touches deeply on all these matters. And I just want to end with a simple thought. You know, what does it do to our sense of climate change and climate? if we recognize that the climate itself is the commonwealth of breath born of us, all us creatures interbreathing with one another, filled with the ghosts of our ancestors, but also the ancestors of the humpback whales. What does that do to our sense of climate? Is climate change a consequence of us forgetting the sacredness of this mis mystery, this mysterious medium that we all participate in and create through breathing, through this reciprocity we call, we call breath. Here's uh, a poem, if I can end with a tiny haiku-like poem by Rainer Maria Rilke. I'll say it in English, it's translated into English, but hopefully your, the translators will be able to make something of this. It's very brief. Again, this is Rilke, he says, Ah, not to be cut off, not through the slightest partition shut out from the law of the stars. The inner, what is it if not intensified sky hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming. Thank you all. Thank you so much, David. And I yeah, love to just be in silence now after the poem, but I will say a little bit more just to, to, to give some final message to you all on 
um, our next uh, talk as part of our series that will be with Om Sunisa from Thailand. And there is the QR code that you can, it will take you straight to our website with more information. So I hope you join us to continue this rich um, yeah, thread of conversations ongoing with different, different speakers from different places in the world. Um, and the next, the next slide um, will be for those of you in Hong Kong. We are very fortunate to be uh, welcoming for from the 22nd to the 31st of October this year, uh, Satish Kumar, who is an elder that has been inspiring people around the world. He's the founder of Schumacher College that um, David has mentioned to us before. Um, when he joined the Zoom, that is uh, one of the, the, the places that he loves teaching um, in this world. So we hope you can come and see Satish at the farm and also different events that will be happening. So more details to be shared uh, soon. So do scan the QR code, keep an eye on our, the social media of the farm and also on your email, because joining this talk means you're also then part of the mailing list. So more details soon. And then also do have a look at the membership program, which is a way that you can be closer to the, the work at the farm um, and also support the nature conservation, the holistic education, the regenerative agriculture, and also the sustainable living programs. So do have a look at how you can become a member. Um, and you will receive um, a questionnaire by email uh, shortly, and we really appreciate you. We know it's not fun to answer uh, questionnaires, but it really helps us to keep improving your talks and making this an experience where you all uh, are as inspired as you seem to be uh, just now through the, all the chat and the messages. And so do, do if you can answer the survey and do keep keep coming to our talks and thank you all for the donation. And this talk will be available um, in the, the farm's YouTube channel. So please help spread it to, to other people who you think would be also inspired to hear David's words. And with that, yeah, thank you so much for the translators um, to be also playing with words uh, during this, uh, this talk and dancing with words along with uh, David, so thank you so much for the very active work you've been uh, doing today. And with that, thank you all. I don't know, David, if you want to say any any other word. Oh no, just that it was a great, a great joy and pleasure to be in contact with all of you. And um, and the person that asked about the poem, that poem does not have any title. Perhaps mm -hmm. just the first line, you know, on not to be cut off. Um, it's a brief poem by Rilke. And um, beautiful, amazing that we can do this, stretching around <laughs> our larger body uh, of the sphere. Amazing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful Saturday. Bye.